The reading for this uh, morning's message comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 14, verses 17 through 24. Uh, we're going back to the story of Abraham, who um, was originally just called Abram. And that, that's another story in itself, how God changed Abraham's name. And... Um, and um, there was a group of, of uh, kings, small, of small kingdoms who came and raided Sodom and took uh, Saul's, um, Saul's nephew Lot and, and a bunch of people from Sodom um, captive. And uh, Abraham went with his men, gathered a bunch of other people together and, and de- defeated them and, and set Lot and, and uh, the people of Sodom free. So this is the, where we, we come into the story. And let us listen to the word of God. After his return, after Abram's return from the defeat of Kedarlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who who went with me. Let Honor and Eshcol and Mamre take their share. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, enable us to see your calling to us in the fighting of, in the fighting of battles with Abram and the giving of the offering to the Lord Most High. Be Most High to us. Be first, O God. Be our best. Be our love. Be our treasure. Teach us that all, all of our treasure is a gift from you. Teach us that our very lives are a gift from you to, to return back into your care, into your guidance, into your cause, into your mission for loving the world and restoring the world to yourself in Christ. Lord, teach us to be givers like Abram was to you and to those who helped him. Lord, teach us to be givers, and bless Jim as he brings a message from your word on on what it means to be a giver and a lover of you. In Jesus' name, amen. From our call to worship this morning, um, verses 6 to 9, let me remind us again of what it says. The Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory do his name. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. Worship the Lord with splen- in the splendor of holiness and tremble before him all the earth. We worship a great God who is the Lord of heaven and earth. 
His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is over, endures from generation to generation. It's amazing and it's an exciting thing that God does not change, but yet in every generation, God, the people who worship him, gather as we have this morning to praise him and to, to remember who he is and to exalt his name. And part of that is in the singing. And we bow our hearts, bow our hearts down before him and with praise and worship. Also, it involves submitting our, our lives in obedience to his words. Um, true worship is offered from the Spirit by those who worship God in spirit and truth. And Jesus says in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So we do that. We gather each week to worship the Lord God Almighty, to seek to know him, to worship him, and as he truly is, and as he has revealed himself through the pages of the Holy Scriptures. Our worship begins with songs of praise that, that testify concerning his greatness. Often we express our worship in words of the saints who are, their wor praises and words are found in the pages of the Holy Scriptures. Often in worship of those who know him and seek him to honor his goodness and his name, there's also an opportunity to give an offering. The giving of an offering is not just the giving of money to the work of the church, but I think it's first and foremost, it's an offering is is. It's an act of worship to the living God, an act of, of lifting up our praise and thanksgiving to him. So we give an offering, but it is as, a, as, a, a, as an expression of that worship that we have for him in thanksgiving. We're expressing thanks. We are honoring him for who he is and all he has done for us and has given to us. So we take a portion and we give it back to the Lord in a way that goes to the one who rules over all creation, both heaven and earth. He gives the rain and season. He causes the trees to grow and crops to prosper. And we say thanks. We are saying in our Offerings that we are saying, I thanksgiving to him and a praise to him for all that he's given to us. So this morning, I would like us to consider four questions concerning the giving of tithes. Tithes and offerings, what are they? Number two, what was the Old Testament practice concerning tithes and offerings? And number three, is tithes still part of New Testament practice or did it pass away with the law? Number four, what are tithes to be used for if they haven't passed away in today's church? So let's begin with the first question, tithes. What are they? A, sim a simple definition. A tithe is to take one-tenth of something. A tithe is one-tenth part of something and paid in contribution, sometimes to a relig religious or organization or a compulsory tax to a government. Today, here in America, tithes are voluntary and paid in cash or checks, and whereas historically tithes were required and paid in kind, such as agricultural produce and animals. Donations to the church beyond what is given in the tithe today, we often call that offerings. You know, we pass the offering plate. And it is, this brings us to our second question. What was the Old Testament practice? What was it really? And I think in the time of the Old Testament, tithing was practiced 
in the culture in general. It wasn't just a religious thing that people did. Many governments asked their citizens to pay one-tenth tax from crops and commerce. One of the first times to actually find the mention of the word tithe in the Bible, paying of one out of ten, was done by the our passage for today's reading. It's, it's done by Abraham. And so I think that's a very good place to start. He paid one-tenth of all the goods that he took in war when he rescued his nephew Lot. When the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela were defeated in battle. Abraham's nephew Lot and much wealth was taken as a prize of war. And when Abraham heard of it, he pursued them. He overtook them along with his trained men, those born in his house, 318 of them. They went as far in pursuit as far as Dan, and he divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants and defeated them and pursued them as to Hoba, north of Damascus. And then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen Lot with his possessions and the people with, that were with them. His offering of tithes is recorded in Genesis 14, 17 to 24. Abraham's return from the defeat of Kedor Leomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shava, and that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, went out, brought out bread and wine. Melchizedek was priest of the Most High God, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and Blessed it be the God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Thus Abraham offered to God to a tithe to God Almighty by giving one tenth to Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. Jacob also promised a tithe, to give a tithe of all that the Lord gave to him. And that's found in Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 and 22. Jacob left Beersheba, and we know the story. He went toward Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And you, in you, and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done all that I have promised to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. I did, I did, did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took a, the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on it, on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. And then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will, give me, will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, 
and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord's then the Lord shall be my God, and, and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be his God's house, and of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So both Abraham and Jacob promised to give to their God a tithe of one-tenth of the goods that they received from the hand of the Lord. And it is, was in an act of worship, of thanksgiving, and, uh, and even a vow of commitment to serve him and, and make him their God and, and, and give return and honor to him as the one who provides for them. Tithing was also commanded in the law. And if we go in search of that and we can find some of the verses that refer to tithing from Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 to 29. Tithing was from every year, and it was the increase of crops and livestock. Beginning in verse 22, you shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year, and before the Lord your God in the place that he will choose. To make his name dwell there. You shall not eat the tithe of your grain. Or you shall eat the tithe of your grain and of your wine and your oil and the firstborn of your herd and flock that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And it, if the way is too long for you so that you are not able to carry the tithe when the Lord your God blesses you, because of the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn it into money, bind up the money in your hand, and go to the place that the Lord your God chooses, and spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household, and you shall not neglect the Levite who is within your towns, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. At the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in, that, in, the, in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner and the fatherless and the widow who are within your towns shall come and eat and be filled that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. It's a little bit long passage, but I want us to take away from it three things or several things in the passage that we need to note. First, the tithe was gathered yearly and put in places in, to store it in the towns where the people lived. The tithe belonged to the Levites, and it was the, as, as their inheritance. But also the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widows were allowed to eat the tithe. So second, they were to gather also a second portion from the gain of their produce and take it and sell it for money, or to take it, if it wasn't too far to travel, to the central location of the tabernacle to be used in the worship of Yahweh at that location. Leviticus 27.21. It says this about the inheritance of the Levites. To the Levites I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meeting and they shall bear their iniquity. 
It shall be a perpetual statute, perpetual statute throughout their generations, and among the people of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as a contribution to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore I have said of them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. Speaking of the land, they were, they were only given Levitical cities to dwell in and the pasture lands surrounding it, but no um, territory, large territories like the other tribes were given. There was also a tithe of the tithe. Everyone was to offer a tithe of produce and livestock that they owned, but even the Levites were to practice tithing. Many people are surprised at this because their inheritance is the tithe, but they're to take the best of the tithe that they receive and they're to offer a tenth of that as an offering of, from their inheritance to the Lord. In Numbers chapter 18, 25 to 29, the Levites were commanded to take a tithe of the tithe and offer it to the Lord. Here's what it says, verse 25. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Moreover, you shall speak to the Le and say to the Levites, When you take from the people of Israel the tithe that I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present a contribution from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. And your contribution shall be counted to you as though it were the grain of the threshing floor and, and as the fullness of the winepress. So you shall also present a contribution to the Lord from all your tithes, which you receive from the people of Israel. And from it you shall give the Lord's contribution to Aaron the priest, out of all the gifts to you, you shall present every contribution due to the Lord. For from each, its best part is to be dedicated. This talks about receiving the best of the, the, the tithe, the things that were holy and set dedicated to the Lord. And then because it's dedicated to the Levites in their service, it is also taken and the best of it is offered in worship to the Lord. So we see that everyone was to practice tithing, giving to the Lord one out of ten of everything that the Lord gave them. Tithing was part of their duty and worship before the Lord. The tithe was given to the Lord's representatives who looked after the place of worship, who had the responsibility to teach the law to the people. A second portion of the tithe was also taken to the place of worship where it was used in the worship of Yahweh. It was, give, it was to be eaten in celebration of thanksgiving and praise to Yahweh for his goodness and bounty from the earth that he had given to the people. So my next question, question number four is, is tithe still part of New Testament practice? The next question I would, you know, is seek to answer this question. Is tithing taught in the New Testament? Is there still a part in the New Testament practice of tithing? I once heard a pastor and a, a new missionary candidate debating whether the New Testament teaches and commands the practice of tithing. The missionary argued that the word tithe and tithing is not taught anywhere in the New Testament. A careful examination, though, shows that tithing was mentioned by Jesus in a rebuke to the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. Jesus said, For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. This comes from Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. 
From this we know that at the time of Jesus, tithing was still practiced. Jesus does not at any time replace tithing with a new practice or a different teaching. It is also mentioned in the letter to the Hebrews that Abraham offered a tithe to Melchizedek, in, and it's actually in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 4 to 10. And it talks about the passage in the Old Testament that we've already read. From this, we are also reminded that tithing was part of worship before God gave Israel the law. Other than that, it is hard to find a passage that specifically mentions the practice of giving a tithe. Some of the closest passages occur in relation to the mention of offerings that are used for the support of those who work in preaching the gospel full-time and looking after the flock of God. Paul and others with the right were given the right to be supported with the gifts of, of offerings and tithe. And this comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 3 to 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 3 to 18. Paul says this about himself. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier as his own expense? Or who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say things on my human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman sh should plow in hope of the thresher and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown things among you, is it too much that we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not, do not we even more? Nevertheless, I have not made use of this right, but we endure rather than anything, rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and that those who serve at the altar share in the sacrifices, offerings? Verse 14, he concludes with this very important say, saying, in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Verse 14. But Paul, he says, I have not made use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provisions, for I would rather die than to have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel it gives me no ground for boasting, for, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may, ha I may present the gospel free of charge so as to make full use of my right in the gospel. So what's Paul saying here? Paul's taking the passages from the Old Testament which say that the Levites are to get their living from the offering of tithes and he takes the principle of support for those who labor in the preaching of the gospel and comparing it to those who work in the labor of teaching the word of God in the Old Testament who work in looking those today in his time who are looking working after the church 
that they should be considered similar to the Levites of the Old Testament. The Levites got their support and inheritance from the tithe that was given to the Lord. He says that he and others like him have the right to support for their labors. So whatever tithes and offerings that are given are to be used in today's church to help support the spread of the gospel for the payment of the living expenses of those who are laboring in the preaching and teaching of the gospel of the, to the church. He does not specifically call the gifts and offerings collected by these groups of believers a tithe, but he is using it as an example for the support of the receipt of their gifts to be used in the support of full-time preachers and teachers of the gospel, those who work in the church. So we can conclude then that gifts used for that purpose are like those of tithes, and tithes and offerings today can be used for the support of the church. Support of those who are laboring in the, the preaching of the gospel. So he repeats this again in another place in the New Testament, in Timothy, 1 Timothy Chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. This is what he says to Timothy. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of a double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Very similar talk to what he has already said about himself. He's saying that, to Timothy, just like the, the ox is allowed to eat from the grain, he's, he's, the laborers in the church ought to receive something. He's talking about elders who rule well, are, be considered of receiving wages for their efforts. This has long been recognized as the practice by Christian churches. The collection of tithes and offerings has been practiced and taught by the church and was mentioned in many of the early church councils. Tithe is used for the payment of church workers and for the spread of the gospel. So all that brings me to, I don't know if I've conv convinced you yet that it is still valid in the church today, but it is. And there is authority for it in the, in the New Testament. What so my fourth question then is, what are tithes and offerings used for in today's church? Although tithes and offerings are used to support of the ministry of the church and those who spread the gospel, which is what we've already heard Paul saying, I would like to suggest there is another primary purpose that we cannot forget. Consider with me. We offer tithes and offerings primarily as an act of worship. It's an act of worship. And I confess that we, as in this congregation, have, I think, neglected that aspect. Um, our little box sits in the back of the, in the church. Some don't even know it's there when they come in and go out. They don't know what it's for. We, we have neglected the focus on giving an offering of tithes and offerings as an act of worship. Let's describe it this way. It's an adoration is the expression of our hearts when we are grateful for what God has given to us. We offer tithes and, and gifts to the Lord, knowing that all that what we have comes from God, and he's given it to us. As God's children, we come to worship before him we worship as the response of his creatures to our creator in our desire to honor and with reverence the god and our creator through prayer and reading of his word and the preaching of the word of god and singing of songs and hymns and instrumental praise as well as observance of communion these are done for his honor and glory in addition these to these, we worship through the giving of tithes and offerings. It's all part of, of our worship. So with the onset of COVID, many churches stopped 
passing the collection plates. It's one of the, the fallouts of, of COVID in the church today. They went to placing them at the back of the church where people could, were free to place their offerings. And whether they were still able to maintain a focus enough to allow people to know that there is a place for their offerings and there is a time for their offerings, I don't know. But we, we have not always done that here. Doing this has one unfortunate disadvantage in that we have neglected to fo- focus on the offering as an act of worship. While some have preferred this method of giving because it allows us to give our offerings in a matter that draws less attention to ourselves, not letting the left hand know what the right hand is doing, possibly that has something to do with it in some people's mind. Um, It puts less pressure also on those who give who are casual visitors, and it tends to leave the offering um, as a forgotten part of the service. It has been observed in this congregation that many of us who are either farmers or retirees, we receive our income only once a month or at certain times of the year, which means that our tithe is given primarily at one time of the month. So a regular passing of the plate, if we're only putting the tithe in, would feel a bit awkward. But if, but if we're giving tithes and offerings and something in addition to our tithe, then the offering plate has a place still in the worship of the, of the actual ceremony, the acts of worship that we are doing together. So as a congregation, we need to find an appropriate balance that still maintains an opportunity to give as part of the worship, where we still have special offerings, we still have an offering plate or a way of collecting offerings, but also does not um, put unnecessary pressure on anyone to give. Because the scriptures say, and we'll talk about this more next week in terms of what is an appropriate and what is an inappropriate way of giving and the ones that are unacceptable to the Lord. But in this one, I think it's important for us to know that God loves a cheerful giver and there are opportunities to give. So the, I received two, a couple comments over the past few weeks. One is that the box in the back is often forgotten and hard to find what it's used for. And another comment was that the cloth baskets on these poles here, if we use those, they can make people feel uncomfortable if, if they are not wanting to, to give it an offering at that time. So we need to find a solution. Find a way that we still worship with tithes and offerings. So there is a way that we can do this, and we can talk about it, and we can work it through this, whether we decide not to use these or we use something else that can be passed. The reason these are actually beneficial is that you don't have to touch it. That's part of COVID, the one solution to COVID, um, where other things, if you have actually have a plate, that gets touched all the way down the aisle between every person and potentially spreads COVID. So I, I haven't included anything here in terms of um, layman, and I hope you're not thinking that I'm t- preaching this because I'm a layman and I'm preaching and I want some benefit. I am not doing that. I want us to worship from the heart, and I want us to recognize that there's a place for our worship in the tithe, giving of tithes and offerings. So in closing, I'd like to offer the following conclusions. Collection of tithes and offerings is an important part of our worship. They should be gathered and dedicated whenever we gather for worship because we, are all, we all need an opportunity to worship through the giving of tithes and offerings. We should feel free if we are not moved by the God Spirit to give an offering at that time, free not to put something in without feeling guilty or putting pressure on someone, but at the same time, there should be the opportunity to give. Tithes and offerings can be used to support the work of the church, to meet our budget, and to pay our clergy, our pastor, and other ministries, our missionaries. 
This study is nowhere com near complete. <laughs> it's a big topic, and especially if you talk about offerings, because <laughs> I haven't even begun to search the scriptures concerning offering and types of offerings, ways which we can offer ourselves and other things as offerings to God. So I want to leave at this point and say, stay tuned. <laughs> this is part one. <laughs> we'll come back to this and address this question. When, like, when, when are our tithes and offerings unacceptable to God? We'll talk, begin there next week. When are they unacceptable? Because there are times when God rejects them and takes no favor for them and does not give a blessing and return to something because it's given in an inappropriate way. So we'll go back to that next week. And be, as clothing here, rather than closing in prayer to the sermon, I'm going to ask Brian to take the offering box and bring it to the front of the, the church here. And we're going to dedicate our offering this morning. So if you all would stand with me and we'll, we'll offer this to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do bow our hearts before you and we do want from the heart to worship you as our God, the giver of life and health and blessings and everything that we have in this world and life. From wherever they've come from, from the ground or from the sky or from your, your hand, they come from your hand. And we offer to you our tithe and our offerings over and above the time, things that you have given to us that we might say thank you to you and worship and thanksgiving and rejoice in your presence in the goodness of what you've given to us and share that as a communal community of worship and thanksgiving to you. So we thank you for this offering that's in the box this morning and we pray that you'd Receive it from our hands, dedicate it, we dedicate it to you and we ask that you bless it to use it for the purposes of your church and, your, and for your kingdom here on earth. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.